Okay, so let's get started. Thank you everyone for coming. I'm um, very proud to welcome you tonight to hear some wonderful speakers. I'm very interested in the wise advice, hopefully, that we'll hear. So I won't keep you any longer. Uh, and I'll introduce Amar, who will later introduce Cliff. So, okay. Amar. Thank you so much for having us. My name is Omar, and uh, it's not every day that you get to introduce uh, one of your biggest inspirations. And I, and I don't, I don't say that lightly. Um, I met Cliff two years ago, and to be honest, my first impression was this guy was full of shit. <laughs> he uh, kept telling me all these things that he wants to create and things that he's created in the past, and I was like, how is this possible? This guy is either just delusional or he's just like a big talk guy, and. Uh, kind of as time passed and the more I got to know him and, and know more about what he's building, the more I realized that uh, he's actually not full of shit and, and in fact he's, uh, he's, he's doing something that is quite um, impactful and, and, and quite phenomenal to be honest. Um, there's two specific things when, when people ask me like why is he your, the biggest inspiration in your life and it's uh, you know I, I boiled it down to two things. One, he is unapologetically living to be the main character of his own story. He has been able to turn his greatest pain into his greatest power, and through that, create something for the rest of the world that, that they can benefit from. And what I'm talking about here is uh, Speechify, which is what I'm going to be sharing more about today. The second thing is the fact that I, you know, there's so many great minds in the world, and, and Cliff is absolutely one of them, but his ability to lead from the heart is, is nothing like I've ever seen before. Uh, and the way he treats people around him, the way he treats his team, the way he's been able to build this like global family spread over you know tens of countries, over 85 employees now, and it all started from his uh, college dorm. So uh, I'm always excited and thrilled to be around him uh, and around his energy. And I'm very, very happy that you guys showed up to, to listen to his talk today. And, Get to know more about the, just the incredible story that he uh, that he's got to share. So, without further ado, help everybody please help me welcome Cliff Weitzman. This is way too kind. Take everything Omar said and like reduce it to like ten percent of what he implies, and it goes both ways. Okay, so hi, my name is Cliff. I'm the CEO of Speechify. I'm just gonna raise the energy in the room for one second. Okay, I'm glad you all are here. Uh, I have two main goals in the talk today. The first one is to make you all believe that anything you can do, that you can think of, you actually can do it. And anything that you can think of that you wanna learn, you can learn it. And I'm credible in saying this because like a couple of years ago, I was sitting exactly in your seat. Uh, the second goal that I have, is to share with you a couple of stories uh, that I experienced along my way to building Speechify. Uh, from the start, when I was like in high school, starting college, and started building things out of my dorm room, to what it took to recruit the first few people to join me in this journey, and to now what it took for us to get it to you know, 10 million people using Speechify, and 85 people working on the company with me. So I'll give you kind of a little bit more of a background. So I'm originally from Israel, uh, and I grew up there, and I moved to the US when I was 13. And when I was a little kid, I was very ambitious. I wanted to be Prime Minister of Israel, I wanted to be a billionaire, I wanted to be a pop star, I wanted to make a significant contribution to science. Uh, I called it inventing fire. And I also finished reading my first book when I was in eighth grade. I was very bad at reading. Like first, second, third, fourth grade, I like could not figure it out. And I have four younger siblings who are all very smart. And at a certain point, it just became the case that my parents started being like, you know, his teachers are telling us that he's, he's slow. And we can see that he's lazy. But like, the discrepancy is so big between Cliff and the rest of the siblings that like, maybe it's not that just that he's stupid. Maybe like something else is going on. Turns out I have dyslexia. And I also have ADHD. And when I got diagnosed in third grade, it was the best day of my life. Because for the first time, I had an explanation about what was going on. And I can tell people, you know, I'm not lazy and I'm not stupid. My brain just works a little bit differently than most of the people's brains do. Um, and actually, I'm awesome. I just gotta find a way to prove it. And I really wanted to learn how to read. And, you know, my biggest inspiration when I was young was my dad. 
and I really looked up to my dad. And actually, my grandfather was an orphan in Iran, and he worked actually on a, uh, a railroad road, shoveling coal. And he would sometimes sneak away from his job to look through the window of the school. And eventually, he actually became the principal of that school. And when my dad moved to Israel um, with his family, school ended in 10th grade in basically the village they grew up in. And he got a scholarship to go to a school in Jerusalem. And then he went to university. And so my family really values education. And I was really bad at education. And so I wanted my dad to be proud of me. So I would fake read. I would sit with a book. Sometimes it was upside down because I just was really bad at figuring out how letters work. And when I was nine, my dad realized that I was lying about reading books. And so he canceled my dad's birthday party, which, if you can imagine, is like the most devastating thing in the world for a nine-year-old to have happen. But when we realized that I was dyslexic, my dad started reading books to me. And the book I wanted to read the most was Harry Potter. Because all my friends got to read Harry Potter and I think. And my dad worked, so what he would do is he would record Harry Potter uh, on a cassette tape, and he would leave that cassette tape for me, and I would listen to that cassette tape before going to bed. And when we moved to the US when I was 13, we found an audiobook set of Harry Potter in English, and I'm now 27, and I still have the first chapter of Harry Potter memorized. And then from there, I started listening to Narnia, and Percy Jackson, and Game of Thrones, and every autobiography I could get my hands on, and every book about economics, and politics, and fantasy books, and books about technology. And I listened on average to two audiobooks a week. And I've done that for the last 15 years, about 100 books per year. When I got to college, uh, I applied to 26 universities. And I didn't get into too many. Uh, one place that I did get into was a place called Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. And Brown is amazing because it has a very open curriculum. So I studied renewable energy engineering. And I realized very quickly why I didn't get into all these colleges, because I couldn't do the readings very well. Um, you know, I found this hack with audiobooks, but I still really struggled with reading. And in the end, I did the only thing that I could, which is I built a command line tool for my computer that I could read out everything. Um, you know, I could upload a PDF, it would parse that, it would read it. I'd open a website, it would read that too. Later, I built an app that let me scan physical books, and it would read that as well. And this was not a product, this was a hack that I built because I needed it. Now, growing up, I was not good at computer science. Um, if you're dyslexic, you misspell barriers. And if one variable is spelled one way here and another way here, the program's gonna break, it's not gonna run. Um, and so, you know, the first things I did was like, I hacked together other apps to try and make this thing work for myself. And then I asked for help from my brother and other people. And then eventually I did an introduction to computer science class when I was a sophomore in college. And the first assignment took most people about three hours to finish, it took me about 15. And what I would do is I would go to the dining hall, I would take a bag of bread, turn it into eight peanut butter sandwiches, and I would go to the computer science lab at eight, nine in the morning, and I would sit there until midnight every single day for about three months. And I would eat these peanut butter sandwiches there so I wouldn't need to leave. And by the end of those three months, I started to be able to tell the difference between a bug that was due to a spelling mistake and a bug that was an actual computer science bug. And later in my life, I would go on to teach computer science. And I was not the best uh, in terms of teaching you how to you know, implement an API, but I was the best at debugging people's programs because I spent more time debugging than almost anybody else I've ever met. And I ended up doing hackathons. So hackathons are weekends where you go with some friends um, and there'll be you know, a couple hundred folks there. And you build something over the course of two days. And I loved this. I did my first eight hackathons without actually knowing how to code. I would jump on the table, tell people about the idea that I want to have uh, to build, and recruit people onto my team, and we would build it. And so the first eight hackathons I did, I won four of them. And I ended up doing about 40 hackathons. And so when I was in college, I built everything from 3D printed skateboard breaks to iPhone apps and websites and discount programs and payments companies. And by the time I graduated, uh, I knew that I wanted to do my own thing. I did one internship my entire time in college. Uh, you know, the first summer I uh, focused on building a company called Cell Armor. Beforehand, it was called Ball Armor. It would block cell phone radiation from impacting your reproductive organs. The next summer, I built a 3D printed skateboard brake that you would attach to your skateboard that I um, built in CAD, and you could twist your heel and it would stop your skateboard. Um, and then I did an internship, and I hated it. I worked as a product manager at a company called Retail Meetup that had just IPO'd. And I very quickly realized that I believed I could do my boss's 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 job better than they did. Um, and so I decided that I would quit. But they were already paying me, and I had already moved to Austin, Texas to do this job. So I decided I would stay. And I started a new kind of initiative inside the company, and that's what I did that summer. But um, as soon as I finished work, I would go home, and I would you know, freelance as an iOS developer. And then I ended up deciding, okay, well, I need to do my own thing. I was paying for college myself. And I didn't know how I would get out from all these loans that I had. You know, I had a lot of loans. And because of all these loans, I had to get a job. And everybody else around me was getting jobs, like Google, like Goldman Sachs, and McKinsey. And I was like, no, I really don't want to do one of these jobs. Like, 
this doesn't sound like what I want the rest of my life to look like. But I have all these loans. So in the end, I ended up hiring 10 freelancers in the Philippines to find out if I had scholarships for me full time. And uh, I just made a sheet and I numbered it 1 to 100. And I said, I'm looking for scholarships for people who at the time I was not a US citizen. So non US citizens who are studying energy or math or who are eligible as someone who is Jewish from Marin County. And every scholarship had to be more than $5,000. And I ran this process for about four and a half months and I paid off almost all my college loans by doing this. And I was like, great, now I'm free. And that was the first time that I got really good at hiring people remotely. Um, I had started you know, playing around with hiring people other, other times before. And you know, when I had that one internship, I got paid something like $30, $35 an hour. And I was hiring people for a lot cheaper. And so I could work for one hour and employ four or five, 10 people for that time. And so it came time for graduation. I was like, you know, and, and though I decided I didn't want to do a job, I found myself starting to apply to jobs. You know, a friend of mine would apply to be a product manager at Google, and it opened up the application, and I started filling it out. And I remember staying with a friend on, on his couch, filling out this application, and I had this like, out of body experience where I like, got up from the couch and put away the laptop. And I like, stepped out of my body, looked at myself, was like, what are you doing? And I slapped myself. And I was like, don't, don't do this. This is like not what you want with your life. This is this plan B. Don't take a shortcut to plan B. Give a full go to plan A first. And if you fail at plan A, then you can go to plan B. So this is one of the first very useful mental models that I use around making decisions, which is figure out very well fleshed out what the failure mode looks like. So if you fully try something, what does it look like if you fail? So let's say I really try to build a company on my own and after a year, a year and a half, two years, I fail. Well, I can still go home and sleep in my childhood bed in my dad and my mom's house. But let's say they like, were so disappointed that they disowned me and I can't even go there. Well, Omar will probably let me sleep on his couch. Actually, I could think of like 100 friends who would let me sleep on their couches. Um, and if I really needed to, I could freelance as an iOS developer and make $30 an hour. Worst comes to worst, I'll like break, down, like break dance on the street and do backflip and like people will give me money and I'll use that to like buy some friends. Okay, well, let's do that then. Because I don't need to make like crazy amounts of money right now. I'm at the time only 22. Well, how can I make this even, even more easy for myself? And so what I did is I convinced two of my professors in college to sponsor me as a visiting scholar, um, which meant that I still had a student ID. I could basically stay on meal plan. I lived on campus. I just didn't pay tuition and didn't do homework. And I, so I had all kind of the social environment around me. And I decided I was just going to spend that year trying to build stuff. And in that summer, I did not go to do another internship. Instead, I taught computer science and I taught entrepreneurship. And I got paid enough from that to support my life living for 10 months in Providence, Rhode Island, where I was paying about $450 per month in rent. So I worked on a bunch of different projects. And in the end, I came up to a conclusion of what was the type of thing I wanted to build. And the key was I, above everything else in life, my goal was to be the person that I needed most when I was young. When I was young, the thing I really needed was someone to read my books to. And I realized that I get a lot of satisfaction from this idea of creating value. So there's a great essay by Emerson called On Wealth, where he talks about this concept. And he talks about Thomas Savory, who invented the steam engine. At the beginning, it was a pile of scrap metal you know, in his garage. And he applied his thought to matter, rearranged atoms in a certain way, and now you have the first steam engine. And you build something that is way greater than someone's parts. And if you multiply it times a thousand, times a million, you create so much value in the world. In economics, you say you shift the PPF curve to the right. Um, and I was like, that's like magic. But you can do it as a normal human being. I want to do that. And, but I found that not only did I get joy from creating value, the more similar someone was to me, the more joy I would get. And if someone really needed me, the more joy I would get. And so I was like, well, more people will really need a tool who are similar to me. And the answer was people who also have learning differences, especially those who are curious and want to be the best version of themselves. But there's a big difference between how they see themselves and how the rest of the world sees them. And so I had built this tool for myself, but I never thought it could be a company. And I was like, well, let's use a framework for deciding how to, what company to build. So let's say I want to build the first trillion dollar company. That was my goal at the time. Apple, Google, Amazon, we're not a trillion dollar company yet. And I was like, well, if you want to build something that's going to be a trillion dollar company, you have to build something that could not have been created even a year ago technologically. Because if that was the case, somebody else would have built it. Well, what is the technology that is growing the fastest? You know, when Jeff Bezos started Amazon, it was because the internet was growing at like a 3,200%. And I was like, well, the technology that I'm most excited by right now is narrow applications of deep learning. So within artificial intelligence, there's a subcategory called deep learning, um, which is a set of algorithms that are really good at pattern recognition. 
And within those algorithms, the one I, I was most excited about were speech synthesis, natural language processing, transcription, translation, optical character recognition, and recommendation engines. And I'm a nerd, and I would use this text-to-speech thing that I built to just read academic papers about these narrow applications of deep learning. And I was like, if I can come up with something that could combine all these things in a useful way, that would be great. Like, that would be a really useful tool. Um, and actually, Speechify is that. And so it started off as a Mac app, and then what I would do is I would find conferences with people with learning differences all around the world, and I would fly them. And usually they'd be held in like a five-star hotel, and you'd pay you know, $600 for a ticket. I wouldn't do that. I'd like negotiate a discount with United. I'd get like a crappy Airbnb nearby. I'd Uber there, and I'd sit in the lobby until somebody gave me a ticket. And then when the keynote speaker would finish speaking, I would plug in my computer, step up the demo, and I'd talk about Speechify, and no one would kick me off. Uh, and then after I speak, you know, a dozen school heads would offer to fly me to their schools to teach the kids how to use Speechify. And that's when we got all of our first users. Um, and so Speechify, little by little, became the number one app that was used by people like me, who have dyslexia, ADHD, vision, concussions, autism, second language learners. Uh, Speechify has now been the number one app in this category for about two years uh, on the Apple App Store. Uh, the cool part is now only about 20% of our users have some sort of learning difference. 80% are normal people. Doctors, lawyers, accountants, people in the military, executives, people in finance, people in tech. Um, we launched the Chrome extension. The Chrome extension is one of the fastest growing extensions in the history of the Chrome store. People now listen to more than 5 billion words per month with Speechify. So if I want to do all that reading myself for people, I need to you know, not eat, not sleep, not go to the bathroom. And so that's a really cool place to be in. But even more cool is we have 85 people, uh, mainly software engineers, designers, and people who do product. Um, and we did that differently too. So we've been remote first for the last four and a half years. Basically the entire existence of the company. We also moved cities every three to six months. So we started a prominent start that one. And then I unintentionally ended up hiring some people in San Francisco. And then we moved to Palo Alto. And then we moved and we lived in a couple of different cities in Europe. And then we lived in LA. And then we lived in Miami. And now we're living in London. And the philosophy is, you know, surprise, not all smart people live in the Bay Area in California. There's like really talented people. Uh, you know, we have folks in Ghana and the Netherlands and the Philippines and like really all over the world. And we call these people, you know, diamonds in the rough uh, internationally. And so I don't care about your pedigree. I don't care if you went to Brown or Stanford or Harvard or Cambridge. I don't care if you work for Google or Facebook. I care that you have fire in the belly for the product, you have high loads for your team, and you can learn really fast and you ship metrics and you're able to, you know, create features that create value for users, user, uh, user obsessed. And as a company, we have four core principles. We care about extreme product quality, speed, how we do we build things three times faster than it's normal, um, leading with love, we take really good care of each other, um, and frugality, we're very frugal about everything that we do. Um, and that model has proven to be very, very useful for us. And we also have one other very unique trait, which we, is we have an extreme bias towards action. Everybody that we hire into the company, even if they're a leader and they're managing other people, they start off as an individual contributor. So I'll give you the story of some of the people who joined Speechify. Um, the first person who joined Speechify who became a, a very senior leader in the company, his name is Simon Kostadinov. He's originally from Bulgaria, and he joined us when he was 20 years old. Um, he actually went to school in Birmingham here. And uh, he just sent me a cold message on Facebook, and we started chatting. And he you know, messaged a couple of reporters about such. And he didn't know iOS developer at the time, even though that was our only product. But he redesigned the website in the night. Like, I sent him the sketch block, I went to sleep, I woke up in the morning, he was done. I was like, how did you do that so quickly? And he's like, well, else, how else can I help? And he ended up building a scraper that would go to up um, to medium and to product hunt. Identify your Twitter um, handle if you liked relevant articles about audiobooks or dyslexia, and then auto-tweeted you. And then I got him a visa. He moved out to San Francisco. And he started working for us as a software engineer, as an intern. And it took him about a year and a half to become, become head of engineering at Speechify. And about three, four months to become the strongest iOS developer in our team. You know, faster, better than senior engineers retired from Snapchat and Apple. But I didn't know at the time he was ranked number one in math in Bulgaria in high school. And this incredible human being has the highest combination of EQ and IQ of anyone I've ever met. And to be honest, sometimes I think he works more hours in Speechify than I do. Um, and so now he leads operations of recruiting at Speechify. Like his job title has changed like five, six times while he's been in the company. And the thing is, Simon just goes and does stuff. No job is too small. He just has a bias towards action. Um, but all right, Simon is extreme. Let's talk about someone else. Let's talk about Jan. So uh, Jan messaged me when he was 16 years old and he was living in Uruguay. If you don't know where Uruguay is, um, 
Like imagine South America and go to like the very bottom, that's your point. Uh, very small country. He saw Speechify on an Instagram ad, he bought it, and he was like, this is too expensive. So he messaged me, uh, being like, here's how you can improve the product. I did not respond. Um, and then he wrote a huge article with Medium about this, made a 10 minute video on how to improve the product, and said it to me, and to the rest of the team, and to my dad, my mom, my sister, my brother, and so people were like, hey, who is this weirdo? Please tell them to stop messaging him. And I was like, actually, this weirdo's pretty smart. Um, so, you know, we had a little phone call. He sent me back a 10 page PDF about how to optimize our keywords on TikTok. And I was like, this is pretty good. Um, and so eventually, I offered to book him a flight to come work with us, and then he moved to my app. And so, Jan, now, how many people do you manage, Jan? 15. Jan now manages 15 people, and he is 17 years old. Um, but the thing is, he has a massive bias towards action. And Jan was putting up like 14 hour days working for Speechify for what, like three months? Similar story with Simon, similar story with Jack, similar story with Joe, with Christian, with so many other people that work with that Speechify. Um, and so the conclusion from there is actually exactly what Amar was talking about when he did the intro, which is so I'm obsessed, obsessed with fantasy books. Obsessed. Um, you know, Brandon Sanderson is my favorite app, author, and he has a book called The Way of Kings. The main character is named Calvin. I aspire to be Calvin. Like, that's my spirit animal. Um, and the story of this character is he, he ends up being a slave, he's thrown into this army, he's put in like this really bad situation where everybody dies in this platoon. And he just decides that he's going to carry a responsibility for the lives of his men. And when people get injured, he puts himself in danger to heal them. Um, and he like really like from the bottom of his heart kills. And this is a guy who has like he has like, bipolar. He, uh, and he decides you know, he's not gonna commit suicide. He says he's gonna dedicate his life to improving the lives of his men. I think that a lot of people when it comes to mental health, there's like a spectrum. Uh, so some people have a predisposition towards um, you know depression. Some people have a predisposition towards having like a very positive mindset. I'm very very lucky that somehow I have a predisposition towards a positive mindset. And I'm very grateful for that every day. And so my goal is to spread that to as many people as I can. Um, and so we have this concept of speech by called leading the love. I think your success in life can be measured by the number of conversations you finish with I love you. And so I try to do that as frequently as I can. When I you know, meet with friends or on the phone, um, you can think about it as your success can be measured by the quality of your interpersonal relationships. Um, and actually the quality of your interpersonal relationships, you can think about it like if it was a graph, that's the integral of the graph, and actually that's all of love, in my opinion. Um, and so that's how I lead my relationships with my friends. It's also how I lead my relationships with my team. Um, and that goes through everything from, you know, I'm obsessed with books, and I get everybody else that they to listen to books. Uh, I'm obsessed with working out and like having good nutrition. I wrote the nutrition uh, protocols for everybody on the team, and I make everybody else work out with uh, and you know, the same thing goes from them teaching me good habits. Um, and that's the best trick I've found for living an amazing life, is like live with people who are more motivated than you. And it doesn't take any effort to be motivated because like Tyler's already in the gym, Jan's already reading a book, you know, Amara's already traveling. All right, just join them. It doesn't take any new activation energy to do that. Um, but because I spent so much time reading books, I start behaving like the main character of books. And here's the interesting thing if you observe these books. So my favorite characters in books are called OP character, overpowered characters. The one thing you notice about these characters is they're never idle. They're always doing something. They're not just like a lion in bed. Even if they're lying in bed, they're thinking. They're thinking. Like Omar was telling me how he came up with a slogan for his company, Seek Discomfort. He was lying in bed, but like ferociously thinking about ideas. Um, you know, they're pacing, they're doing, they're, they're, they're doing stuff. So like, this is how I live my life. I always have a dream. And the dream can change over time, but I'm like always like running towards that dream. And by the way, here's the part of the keys for why speech power worked out for me. Um, when I was in college, I built like 36 different products, but you don't make progress like this. You make progress by going in one direction, and when you hit a brick wall, you know, you crumple, you pick yourself back up, and you run against the brick wall again, and you slap, you break down, and then you just do this over and over again until the brick wall fully crumbles. And you just keep running in the same direction like Mario. And then like you get bigger like Mario after he eats a uh, what is he? Mushroom. Thank you. And then you can break through bigger walls. And that's how you actually reset the set point of technology, of the world, of politics, of the quality of people's lives. Is you go in one direction and you don't stop. You're like a bulldozer. And if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go with other people. And so that was the other thing that we learned how to do well at Speechify, is I was moving very pneumatically, very fast by myself when I was in college, but when I realized the clear vision and direction of where I wanted to go, 
And you know, I'm not gonna tell you guys that like a huge vision for speech five because you'd be like, this guy is delusional. So exactly the same way that when Amar and I met, you know, I felt close enough with him. We're the same person. Like we were born three days apart, a thousand kilometers apart. We've lived in a bunch of different places. We're the same person. So I shared with him my dreams because he shared with me his dreams first. And so I think that the best way to actually build relationships with people is there's two ways. You either bond over ambition or you bond over vulnerability. And so ideally, you try to build both of those things. And so he's like, yeah, this kid is delusional. And this is what, you know, my brother thought it was delusional, so did my sister. And now the brother's like, actually, he's not that delusional because he keeps doing the things he says he's going to do. So now when I say like ridiculous things, like, no, no, we believe that it's going to happen. Um, so the first thing you want to do is come up with a really big, audacious goal. But have a plan for how you're going to get that goal. And then if people believe that you are a credible source because they've seen you do smaller things beforehand, um, they'll come into your wagon and they'll help you push against those walls together. Uh, but the trick is you need to act like the main character of your own movie or of your own book. Um, so that's bias towards action. Um, I'm gonna tell like, two more stories and then I'm gonna open it up to Q&A. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do two things. I'm gonna tell you one story and I'm gonna tell you a list of principles. So the story I'm gonna tell you is an example of what it means to have a bias towards action, but an extreme example. Uh, when I was a freshman at Brown, my laptop got stolen. You know, I had a backpack, I went to this room, and it came out and the backpack was gone. And I was like, what? I was in the room for like three minutes. Turns out someone had picked up my backpack and you know, it was gone. And I was like, well, what do I do? And I went back to the grass where I was before, the, the backpack wasn't there, I went back to the dining hall, the backpack wasn't there, and I realized there was like a security camera. And I was like, okay, so I went to like the front desk, I was like, hey, can I access the footage from the security camera? They're like, no. I was like, well, why not? And they're like, well, you got like permission. Well, who has permission? Detective the police department. Okay, so we talked to the police department, detective was born there. I was like, all right, well, when are the detectives coming in? They didn't give me an answer. So I just decided to hang out, and I just sat and waited in the front desk of the police department for like two and a half hours until somebody finally came out. And I was like, hey, can, can I look at the security footage? And they went, no. I was like, well, can you look at the security footage? They went, yeah. And I was like, okay, can we do this now? And they're like, fine. So I went to look at the security footage. I found a video of this guy stealing my laptop. Uh, or my backpack with my laptop and stuff. And they're like, okay, well, now we know that somebody actually took it. And I said, I find my half on the phone. And they were like, go back to your dorm, live your life normally, we'll let you know when we find whatever it is. And I did not think that this was a good enough solution to the issue. And I started reeling really in the history of crime around how often this happens, where this happens. Turns out they never find the people who steal stuff. Surprise. Uh, and I was like, okay. And I was like, well, if I stole a laptop, what would I do? I was like, well, maybe I might go to the Apple store and try to reformat it so I can get around the password. And so I made a list of all the Apple stores in Providence, Rhode Island, and in Boston, and New York. And I asked the detective to drive me to the Apple store. He's like, fine, if it gets you off my back. So he drove me. And I'm walking to this mall, like, focused, and on my way to the mall, you know, in the video, there was this guy, you know, six foot something, gray hoodie, blue vest, blue cap. I see this guy in the corner of my eye, charging an iPhone. Gray hoodie, blue cap, blue vest. And I'm like, wow, that's the guy. So I go back to the front of the mall and I'm like, hey, security guard, this guy stole my laptop. He's like, do you have evidence of this? I'm like, hell yeah, I have evidence of this. I open my phone and it's out of battery. Like, Sorry, kid, I can't help you. So I go up to the guy by myself, like, hey, my friend stole me to find my laptop. I couldn't be more happy. I wanted to give you a reward and say thank you. He's like, gets up, I don't have your laptop. No, no, your friend, my friend told me to find my laptop. I just wanted to give you a reward. Say thank you. I don't have your laptop. Leave me alone, kid. Exit the mall. He starts running towards the train station. So I start running after him. And the security guard is now running with me. And he takes three steps, turns around, goes back to the mall. All right. So now I'm chasing down this guy towards the train station. He's like, hey, my friend told me to find my laptop. I wanted to give you a reward. He's like, I don't have your laptop. Leave me alone, kid. And I'm like, okay, this is not going to work. I know you have my laptop. Take it out now and put it on the ground. I was like, I don't have your laptop. I know you have my laptop. Take it out now and put it on the ground. At this point, I was like very small. Like I was like freshman year of high school. This won't make any sense to you. I was five foot two. Sophomore year, I was five foot three. And I gained like 27 pounds of muscle when I was in college. So I was like a stick. Very not threatening. I know you have my laptop. Take it out now and put it on the ground. I will not follow you. Police will not follow you. But if you don't, I will follow you until the ends of the earth until I get it back. I'll follow you to Boston. I'll follow you to New York. I'll follow you to California. This guy looks back at me like, I have stolen the laptop of a mad human being. This is not worth it. So he opens his bag, takes out my laptop, and puts it on the ground. I pick it up, I'll show my checks. 
Here we kiss. He's like, leave me alone, kids. Take out my charger, put it on the ground. <laughs> Got my charger. Found the rest of my stuff in the mall. But the point is, it was a point in that day where I was like, okay, it's like a 3% chance that if I go to all these Apple stores, I'll actually find my laptop. But, number one, I don't have anything better to do with my time. Number two, I work all the summer before this, before this laptop. If I lose it, like, I'm only getting a Dell. So, not worth it. Um, and in life, there's often, you know, option A and option B that you have to choose between. But there's also always option C and option D that you usually don't realize exist because they're way harder to achieve, they require a lot more effort, and they require luck. But sometimes they're worthwhile, right? So a good example is instead of taking a job at Goldman or a job at Google, you take a gap year and you focus on becoming an Olympic fencer, or you start a YouTube channel, or you work at a company, or you fly from Uruguay to work with someone that you think is really cool. Um, and my expectation was, you know, if you run this scenario multiple times, some of the times I get the laptop, some of the times I don't. But when you win, it's such a big win. It's an asymmetric risk. It's such a big win. It's actually worthwhile to take the risk. And here's the thing, you know, I was 22. We're all on our When are you going to take these risks? When you're 30, when you're 40, when you're 50, when you're 60 years old? No, this is the time to do it. And this is the time to take asymmetric risks. But, you know, it, if you guys know what a hedge fund is, it's called a hedge fund because they hedge risk. You know, it's an art, it's a science to manage risk. So you go and you paint out the picture of what it looks like if you fail, and then you figure out what are the safeguards that you can put in to make sure that if you fail, it's fine. But then you optimize for the biggest possible outcome. And the best way to hedge for the risk, by the way, in almost any endeavor, is to make sure that you learn a lot of skills along, along the way. So that if you fail, you now have all these skills, it doesn't matter, you're set for life anyway. And what I found is the best way to learn stuff is by doing it, right? As a founder, you have a really good job, and it's the work. You learn how to code, you learn how to design, you learn how to recruit people, you learn how to run advertisements, you learn all this stuff. As a CEO, you have three roles. Make sure there's money in the bank, set the long-term vision, and put the right people in the right seats. Recruit. Recruiting is the most important role as a founder. And so 90% of my time these days is hiring. You know, I'm constantly looking for talented people to bring out to the scene. In design, and product, in, in, in engineering, in growth, in management, constantly. And I'm constantly interviewing people. And I'm trying to find the most talented people. And I take all my friends who I've ever met in my entire life, and I'm a very social person, and I try to convince them to come join the company. You know, I don't think I've had a friend who I think very highly of who I haven't tried to convince to join the speech bubble. And I'm really annoying. Like every month I send people messages, but this is really the reason why speech bubble succeeds. Is I've succeeded to get the most talented people that I've ever met to come join me on this mission. Um, and the last thing I'll do is I'll share with you guys some of my, uh, basically my last week of college, I wrote a 30 page paper about my world use. And the conclusion of this paper was I'm the person that I am because I got lucky enough to listen to about 100 books per year, because I got lucky enough to have parents who gave me unconditional love when I was young, even when I was failing in everything that I was supposed to do. And because I had the opportunity to overcome this life when I was young. And so I had kind of confidence that I built over time that was not dependent on exogenous variables and success, it came from inside. And partly the reason why it came from inside was because I had this unconditional love. And at the end of the day, what all people want more than anything else is to be loved. And so if you have a family that loves you, great, you won the lottery. But if you don't, you can build your own family external. And the way to do that is to give love to other people first. Whether it be your best friends that you live with or your roommates, or other people who are in your class, or other people who are in your team, or other people who are doing similar things. Just give other people love. It costs you nothing. But if you give people love, they'll give it back to you. And then you'll have a hundred counters to crash on if you ever need them. And then you'll feel a sense of worth, a sense of belonging, regardless of your accomplishments in life. People love you for you, regardless of what it is. And they love you because of the way that you treat them, the way that you see them. And then if you can see not only who they are now, but who they can be, and they realize that you see who they can be, they love you for that even more. And so really, the, kind of those principles for me, where number one is love is the most important thing in life. And the more you give of it, the more you have to give. It's like fire, you can light one flame, and you can light many other flames without extinguishing the original one. And for someone who studied renewable energy engineering, the first law of thermodynamics is energy cannot be created or destroyed. It's mind-boggling that you can create more value like this with love, right? And it's the same example as what I said about the steam engine, where you can create value economically. 
you know, the second big principle for me is you have option A and option B, but you always have option C and option D. They're a lot harder, they take luck, but usually when you're presented with these, these options, you want to go for option D. And there's a bunch more, but I can talk about them later. Uh, and the last thing that I'll say is if you want to start a startup, or if you want to have an interesting life, the key is to find the best people in the world. And so if, you're, if you have a very clear big idea you want to do, just go do it. But if you don't have a very clear big idea, you know, be like John, be like Joe, be like Chris, be like Jack, be, and identify people who are working on something that you think is really cool, that you think have really good values, that you think you'll learn by spending time with, and just be like you know, be incessant about messaging them until you eventually get them friends. All right, that's it for now. I'm gonna let you guys hit me with questions. Thank you for hosting me, Cambridge, and Apple. For So thank you very much for that talk. It's really great to hear where you've come from and where you now are. I also am dyslexic uh, mathematically, so I guess I have a, a question myself which I might kick off with. Um, but yeah, is there something that you think, for those who are mathematically dyslexic, it's obviously slightly different, yeah. could it be transferred or included into your product in some way? What a great question. So uh, being mathematically dyslexic, the term is called dyscalculia. Uh, so if you're dyslexic, what is it? dyslexia to begin with, or dyscalculia, or uh, the brain works a little bit differently for different people, uh, right? There's a right hemisphere and left hemisphere of the brain. Uh, there's these things called mini columns that are in charge of dispersing information in the brain. If you're dyslexic, the mini columns are longer and further apart from normal people. Uh, if you actually you're autistic, they're shorter and more common. So people with autism are very good at you know specific detail. People with dyslexia are not good at that. They're very good with kind of overall thinking, creativity, etc. Um, so a lot of actors have dyslexia. Thirty percent of NASA has dyslexia. Thirty percent of MIT has dyslexia. Though only about seventeen percent of people have dyslexia. Five percent diagnosed. Fifty percent of people who are incarcerated in prison in the U.S. have dyslexia. Dyscalculia often hits people um, when they're doing mathematical equations. So the same way that for me, phonemic awareness is very poor, you have the same thing when it comes to numbers. Uh, so people who have normal dyslexia, word problems are very tough because you have to read the problem and you have to extract the numbers, very, very difficult. And so the, the way that I kind of dealt with this when I was in high school is I would use a highlighter and a pen. I would underline the things and I would turn it into just math instead of um, you know, word problems. For someone who has dyscalculia, uh, I haven't spent enough time thinking about it. Uh, is there something that can help with speechify? Well, the question is, is math easier? Okay, so dyslexia is not a reading disability. It's a decoding disability. Um, you have a bunch of characters on the page, and we invented this idea, right? It's a very new idea, that you can turn those into phonemes, turn those into sound, and then turn those into meaning. Uh, humans have been listening for hundreds of thousands of years. We've only been reading for a couple of thousands, and numbers are also very unidimensional. It's like interesting to think about the world in this way. And so there's a transformation that is going on. Uh, what Speechify does is it removes the need for you to decode the words because it just speaks them to you directly. And so if you're not good at processing you know, the words with your eyes, you can be good at processing them with your ears. So can you use another sense to conceptualize numbers? And so you could use something like Speechify to read out the numbers and now the question is, does it solve the problem that you have with math? Uh, and if it doesn't work via audio, can you make it special, spatial or, uh, you know, uh, what's it called, with touch? Uh, tactile. Um, and so that's the trick, is really the ideal you know, endpoint of Speechify is you just put a book in a blender, blend it, drink it, the information in your brain. We're a little far away from that when it comes to computational neuroscience. It's actually something I really want to work on, but we're like 15 to 20 years away from that being possible. Um, and so we did the next best thing, is we hijacked another sense of your body, which is your ability to hear. We talk about how to listen really fast. So one thing I didn't show you guys is I listen at about 750 words per minute, which is three and a half times faster than most people read. Um, and about 3x faster than what most people uh, speak at. Um, and it's because when I was you know, 14, I would listen to a lot of audio books, initially at 0.75x speed, and then 1x, and then 2x, and then 3x, and I just listen all the time. Um, and so that gave me a superpower. It's kind of like um, uh, Roger Bannister who ran the 4 minute mile. Nobody thought you could run a 4 minute mile, but he just practiced, and then he did, and the next year dozens of other people did it, and now it's like normal high school students. So the question is, is there a way of transforming the mathematical equation to another sense that you are not inhibited by your own So I didn't give you a good enough answer, but hopefully it sends you in the right direction. <laughs>
Thank you so much for this. It's been a wild ride. <laughs> um, I would be interested to know a little bit on, on the product. How do you, initially, how did you give it feedback? Because I'm guessing there should be some human intervention of you're reading it correctly. How did that evolve to beat the scale that you're basically at? Yeah, so for startups, the most important thing is to be customer obsessed. Like you want to talk to users all the time. And so the first thing that I would do is I found a school uh, that had students with learning differences, and I would go into the eighth grade every day, and I would sit with kids, and I would teach them how to use Fusion Fire, and it had bugs. I would sit in the back of the class, like a weirdo, and debug the software so that it would work for me. Um, and then we started to have you know, a lot more scale. The reason we had scale is I started writing my story about dyslexia. I wrote a book publicly online about my experience, 500 words every single day for about a month, and I gained you know, a bunch of followers on Facebook who were typically moms with kids with dyslexia. So we started having a lot of users, um, and then you know, we got featured in a bunch of places. And then maybe like a year and a half in, it was very frustrating because we didn't have enough people uh, using the product and sticking with it for like a long time. And I was like, it's a failure. All this work I'm doing, nobody's using it. And you know, I still was very motivated by it because I knew that the Texas needed to change my life. But the data wasn't showing me that it was changing other people's lives because they were stopping to use it. And partly it was because the product was bugging. Like I was the main developer, we'd scan the document, it wouldn't work. We'd scan it again, it wouldn't work. Like the fourth, fifth time, it's still failing. Of course, you're not going to use it. If you have a really bad dyslexia, you stick through it, and then you'd succeed in reading like a 40 page PDF, and then you'd cry because it was life changing. But then even today, 20% of the reviews in the app store are people who say they cried when they started to use speech five because it was so impactful on their lives. Um, so it's very frustrating right this. And around this time, this is 2017, uh, ICOs were really big in crypto. And I started investing in crypto very early. And I, if I went and did an ICO, like, I was very confident I could raise like 60, 80 million dollars. And I was like, oof, do I do this or do I keep going with speech five? And I had this like beautiful mind moment where I did like this huge pros and cons list in a, in a, with a dry erase marker on the windows of my apartment in San Francisco. Do I go into an ICO or do I focus on Speechify? And the conclusion was, you know, the technology I think will change the world the most in the next 50 years is narrow applications deep learning. And the cross section that I think will, from a consumer standpoint, where users are doing something different is audio. So what's an intersection of audio and AI is actually Speechify. This is where you can create real value. I didn't think that crypto would create real value for another like 10 years. So I decided that this was the thing I should actually focus on. And if I'm going to do something in that intersection, I might as well work in Speechify. So what did I do? How did I talk to all the users? But the first thing that I did is I added a gigantic button on the bottom right corner of the app that said message us. And where did it go? Not to someone in the Philippines, to my personal phone number. And so I was dealing with hundreds of customer support tickets per day to my personal phone number. And sometimes I would send them audio messages, I would send them videos, I would call them. I built relationships with all these users. And when I saw people who were not using Speechify, I made a Google Sheet with thousands of users, know everything that I knew about them, and I would sit at my desk for a week, and I would just call people on the phone. And it was the most tiring thing I've ever done in my life, and I'll tell you why. You call the people, and they're like, who is this? And it's like, oh, this is Cliff from Speechify. Like, Usually they just hang out, but they don't answer. But when they do, they're like, oh, your app sucks. Suck. Oh, it does this and this. That's what I think. It's like someone's telling you to your face that your baby is ugly. <laughs> but like a hundred times a day. Like it's just got to constantly get punched in the stomach. And punch. Like, do you realize, person on the phone, how much of my life I have spent working on this thing? And, you know, well, thank you for getting on the phone with me, for using this free app. You didn't even pay for it right now. And you're telling me how terrible that feels so bad. And so, thank God. I had Simon working with me at the time. Because you can go to a grocery store, you come back with some like chocolate cookies or some bread, and you're like, Cliffy, two more. You get this cookie. Simon so called the people, he's like, two more. And I would just, I called the scissors. And at the end of the day, we found what the bugs were, we fixed the bugs, we saw that actually there were some users who really loved it and used it a lot. And it gave us inspiration to keep going. But that relationship with the users was just keep going. That's it. Thank you. Uh, hi, thanks very much for the talk. Um, I'm very interested in the idea of doing some sort of tech start myself after the university, and I was just wondering what your process was like for raising money for speech fire in the early stages of development. So initially I really was uh, uh, not a fan of the idea of raising money. Um, because I built a couple other products before the made money. 
And so instead, what I did was I made sure that people would be willing to pay for product. So I made a website, it was a one-page website, I actually put it up on Dropbox as the hosting service, and I integrated Stripe, and I made a video where I faked as if Speechify already worked perfectly well. And I like, pre-ordered the product for 100 bucks. And what I did is I made it a goal to post on five Facebook groups, five Reddit groups, and five like Twitter threads every week. And I got a bunch of people to pre-order the product. And I was like, great, I've now proven that people are going to buy this. And at the time, I planned to do a Kickstarter campaign for it. At the end, I didn't end up doing it. But I made a video about it that was going to be in the Kickstarter, and that video did really well. And then a bunch of people saw the video, and some of them you know, reached out and wanted to participate with us. Um, and the other one is you know, friends, introducing people, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is, and you know, nobody wanted to back a text-to-speech education. And so the people who were there for us are actually people who had the selection themselves. So this is one key that I always tell people is really important and underlooked and actually don't see even Paul Graham or a famous startup people talk about this, is your biggest advantage in doing a startup is to find your own personal weakness. And double down on that. Because that's something, your vulnerability, that no one can compete with. Like you just rob them of any opportunity to fight you. Because you're fighting with the fact that you're more vulnerable there. Um, and if, if and, you know, typically in startups, you want to start attacking a very narrow, uh, group of people who will benefit from your product and expand from it. So for us, it started with a slice, and then ADHD, and then low vision, and then concussions, and then autism, and then second language learners, and then all these other people who benefit from a you know thing that we read the internet. Now. So now Speechify is the voice of the internet. We have an API that's integrated across you know, other websites. There's like you know, tens of millions of people using the product who don't have learning differences. But in the beginning, we started with this very very narrow group, and so those were the first users, but those were also the first people who wanted to benefit. Hi, uh, so um, really thanks for the talk, great talk, and I have a question about location and place. So I just graduated college, um, I'm from the US, I'm in Cambridge, my masters, and a lot of my friends who went on to work at Goldman, McKinsey, Google, kind of chose where they wanted to work because of the location. A lot of people just wanted to be in the Bay or wanted to be in New York. Um, and I kind of wanted to ask you about your philosophy, you know, when it comes to where you want to go, because when you talk with Paul Alto or you're going to the Bay, it sounded like you moved there because of the people you want to hire. But, you know, I guess what's behind the philosophy of coming over to the UK, going to Miami? Yeah. Is it, you know, kind of just you want to have fun or is it more so? Does that kind of have a, any effect on, you know, productivity, creativity? You know, I guess kind of what's your philosophy? Yeah. So, how do you decide where you want to live, where you want to go, and why? Um, yes. I optimize for hiring. So when I go to San Francisco, there's a lot of software engineers, there's a lot of founders, I can learn from those people, same thing with Palo Alto. When we started doing a lot of advertising online, you know, we went to LA. We made a lot of friends with people who created content and ran ads on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Um, in Europe, you know, we see that we find a lot of really great tech talent that was much more available because they were not working for Facebook or Google or Apple or all the other places. But it's also the case that at the end of 2019, I lived in London. And I absolutely loved it, and I wanted to live there for longer. But, you know, we'd hired a couple of people in LA, so I moved to LA. But I always had in my brain that I wanted to come back to London. And so as soon as I could, I came back. And so here's my philosophy there. You're only in your 20s once. You're in your 20s, you don't have kids, you don't have a mortgage, you don't have anything locking you down. This is the time to like go explore the world. And so from one perspective, yes, my goal is to build something that is going to be extremely impactful and move the world, not an inch but a mile. Um, but also I have a goal of making, like I literally hunt to base the most awesome people in the world to be friends with. And then I bring them into my life. And they don't all live in California. They don't all live in New York. They don't all live in Brown. They live all over the place. So, you know, I go spend some time where those people are and I get to meet all you wonderful folks. And some of you guys will probably be my friends after tonight. Um, but that could not have happened if I stayed in one place. And it's not like visiting a place where like a little bit helps you do that well. Ideally you want to live there for at least a little bit. Um, and when I go to places, I don't care about what I see or you know, even the architecture. I care about the people. Um, I think I was talking to Jan earlier today. There's about eight billion people in the world now. Um, let's say you have relationships with you know a thousand of them, and they know some other people. Like eventually, you actually get to second degree connections to like the majority of the world if you do this well. But the time to do it is when you're young. Um, and so the other important thing is like who you end up with. You know, who you marry is the most important decision you make in your life. Period. And you know, back in the age of the village, you married a person in your village. And so I dated some people who I thought were absolutely phenomenal humans um, when I was at Brown, when I was in other places, but I want to go around the world to meet as many people as I know I can 
to figure out who is the best person for me. And you know, they come from other cultures, other races, other thought patterns. You want to get exposed to all that. Um, and so, you know, I'd love to go live in Dubai for a bit. I'd love to go live in uh, Sweden, Switzerland for a bit. I'd love to go live in Beijing, in Hong Kong, in Shenzhen, in Hawaii. Just like give yourself the exposure. And the way that I do it is I have uh, one of my teammates go on Airbnb, message 40 Airbnbs and lowball that like 30 to 40% of the value of the property. Um, and then I will book for like three months with the option to extend for one month after. Um, and I'll book at this point bigger houses and I'll bring all my friends with me. Um, and I have not signed a 12 month lease ever. I signed it once and I broke out of the lease after like two or three months. Uh, that I find is a much more rewarding way to live your life that allows you for a lot more growth. But you couldn't do this like even 10 years ago, probably. Like everything makes it a lot easier. Remote work makes it a lot easier. The ability to bring your friends with you makes it a lot easier. Uh, Wi Fi connectivity is a lot better than it used to be. Like there's all these things that you have, like, the quality of life that we have now is like so much better than it ever was before. And we all have the opportunity to have the most privileged lives in the history of the world by a huge margin. It's easy to start companies. It's easy to work remote. It, healthcare is better. And entertainment is better. So take advantage of it. Thank you so much for the stories you share. I'm a PhD student here. Um, and I've been working on my company for the past year and a half, but it was started during the pandemic. So everybody that we were recruiting was all around the country. And then, you know, we couldn't be able to visit all of them. So my question to you is, your teams around the world, how do you create a company culture with people that, in many cases, can't go be consistent and can't be other members of their team all the time? Yeah, so we love Slack. We work with Slack a lot. We hate meetings. Like, I basically don't allow meetings. Um, but you can, like, co-work together. Yeah. But, like, there's not going to be a situation where, like, someone is talking and you are sitting there listening, but you hate you. Like, there's no point in that. Um, I have an app on my phone called Time Buddy. It basically shows me uh, one time, like, here's the time in London, and here's the time in, like, you know, Paris, San Francisco, Uruguay, New York, etc. cetera. Um, I work around the clock. Like, I take meetings all the time. And I think uh, Jeff Bezos is a good line about, like, work-life harmony. Um, you know, when I feel like working out, I go work out. Even if it's, like, you know, 11 a.m. in the middle of the day. Uh, but I'm also open to having a call with you at 3 in the morning because I go to sleep late. Let's do it. It's amazing because I start working on something in San Francisco, hand it over to our financial engineers in Ukraine. They hand it over to like a developer in like France, and then it's worked on something in London, and someone in New York, and then it's passed by like it just like the sun never sets on the speech of my empire, my empire at this point. Um, and the people in the company who I'm really close with, who not only work with me but can also be my best friends, uh, I find ways of getting them to move to where I am. And this is its own genius for me. You know, I am so good. I, I'm not gonna be humble about this. I'm so good at getting people visas, green cards, O ones, TN visas. It doesn't matter. I'm a wizard. Uh, so, so I do that, and it changes people's lives. Uh, and then I will spot some people's rent. I'll be like, come live with me. Like, I have a room. Stay for a weekend. And then you know, I kind of convince them to not book the flight back. And then a week into the week, and three weeks, and three months. And so that's the trick: is you know, identify the people in the company who you know, Jan worked with us for about three, four months remotely, and he just created so much value. And it was so clear that he had five levels of intense, and then I would become a better person for him being around me. That I suggested he come live with us. Uh, he was open to it. So if you have folks like that, people like that who you're working with, invite them to come live with you. So, I love music, so it's not, I actually. I'm considering showing you guys a song I recently wrote. Do you guys want to check out the song? Yeah. Yeah? All right, I'm sure it's good. So this is a good example of finding things that give you energy. Go oh, on. This is a good example of finding things that give you energy and incorporate them into your work. Uh, so I really like uh, words. And I really like music. In a, another life, I'm not be a musician. But, uh, you know, I think it's more cool to build software that impacts people's lives. So that's what I decided to focus on. Uh, but luckily, in my job, we need to make ads. We make ads on Instagram. I'm sorry if I'm talking to you a million times. <laughs> and TikTok, and YouTube, and a bunch of other places. And uh, actually, this is a good story. Earlier this year, I came across this artist on TikTok that I thought was amazing, Connor Price. I was like, this guy is absolutely phenomenal. And so I sent him a DM, and he responded. And I was like, hey, you remind me of like a cross of like Lynn Manuel Miranda, Andy Grammer, John Bellion and logic, um, I want to have a flow like you, can you teach me? And he was like, yeah. 
Uh, and, this, and, and so we got on a Zoom call, and we had like four Zoom calls, and I had an idea for a song I wanted to write, and he helped me like hone some of the lyrics. And then I flew to meet him in Las Vegas, and then I recorded this song in his house. And he like helped me figure out a delivery. And it's gonna eventually be an ad, but it's about my experience with the slice. So I'll show you this. I never was born as a kid with the words in the book kept flipping and jumbling. Well, every other kid was a class just running through pages and tripping and stumbling. How come every time that I'm trying to figure out a sentence, it feels like a math equation? At least with that, I got a calculator. The teacher tell me hurry up because the class is waiting. Damn. Anxiety rising, look at my face, try to hide behind it. I don't want them to see that my eyes are crying. Say I gotta go use the bathroom, I lie about it. Either that or I pretend to read. Got home that night, couldn't get to sleep. Told my dad how I felt, and I hope that he wouldn't think less of me. It's when he said to me, I know how you feel, and I wish you could see what I see in you. If you got nothing left to believe in, you know that I believe in you. If the class turned gray, just know that a new day is peeking through. When the words on the page all turn into pain, don't be afraid, I'll read to you. Everything flipped, but I learned how to read with my ears instead of my eyes. Get my headphones on, I'm gonna listen to the words on the page. I'm wasting a second of time. Hit a roadblock when I got into econ class. Couldn't find any audio books for that. So I'm surfing the net, trying to find a tool. But I can't find a thing, now I'm feeling school. Wait, you couldn't ever let it get to me. Gotta find another way to turn text to speech. So I learned how to code, how to keep up JavaScript. Highlighting the words, they stop to flip. I'm just an infast, it's stopping it. No limit on me, y'all confidence. But I'm busy when I'm hurt and I'm insecure. I sit with myself and I write these words. I know how you feel and I wish you could see what I see in you. If you got nothing left to believe in, know that I believe in you. If the clouds turn gray, just know that a new day is peeking through. When the words on the page all turn into pain, don't be afraid, I'll read to you. I like how I couldn't read books when the books all read to me. Instead of just skimming the pages, we're scanning pages and we listen back easily. So if you get bored and resort to procrastination, no retention when you read the lines, Chrome extension for the peace of mind. Cause anything you want to read, you can speech and follow up. Playing field doesn't level it out. Everybody learns different, it's evident now. One skill should never put a limit on a kid's potential. Should it force them to fit the stencil? 20 years later, when the stop fell down, cause the whole class laughed to the fact that it was struggling. I was talking, and I'm afraid that I can't always be next to him. It's one step in front. I know how you feel, and I wish you could see what I see in you. If you got nothing left to believe in, know that I believe in you. When the clouds turn gray, just know that a new day is peeking through. When the words on the page all turn into pain, don't be afraid, I'll read to you. But I'm gonna stop because I think we're over time. But I'm gonna hang out. You guys are welcome to hang out with me. Um, and we'll answer any more questions you guys have. Thank you guys for spending time with us. Thank you.